Hey, did you Holy hear? shit, man. Just about to break my fast and you're hopping in like that? Jeez. Just had some juicy new and exciting fasting news and never mind. Wait, what, what news? You gotta tell me now. No, no, I'll, I'll let you eat in peace. You don't need to know how a six hour and four hour feeding window affects weight loss. Whatever. You know what? Whatever. Good. Some people. Wait, what? Get, get back here. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to a, another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. This week, we are back on the topic of fasting and we are exploring some new and exciting research highlighting how two similar yet different time-restricted feeding protocols fare in improving what I will call fasting's primary use case, and that is weight loss. It shouldn't be the primary use case, but it is. That's why most people turn to it. There's so much other cool stuff going on, but this is what this research looked at. And as we know through all of our other fasting talks, and there have been quite a few, haven't there? Weight loss, like I just said, is many times the byproduct of all the other super cool, awesome stuff happening at the cellular level when implementing a protocol. Things like improved insulin sensitivity, glucose tolerance, reduced oxidative stress, fatty acid breakdown from one's newfound metabolic flexibility. I can finally touch my toes. And of course, a little autophagy action because autophagy action is the best kind of action, but you know that. And like I said, those are just a few of many driving to this overarching weight loss. Now, when we talk research and human trials, in the grand scheme of things, there have been very little human studies done measuring the effects of different intermittent fasting protocols on weight and other health metrics. It's growing, which is great, but as you can imagine, there are still a ton of questions. And science loves questions. You should too. And if you're interested in learning about all the other research, you can check out the Fasting 101 playlist, where I also document a lot of my N of 1 self experiments through a lot of different protocols, including alternate day fasting, early time restricted feeding, keto, early time restricted feeding, OMAD, 16-8, 18-6, and a bunch of other things. So take a ponder if you're interested. Now, this new research, which was recently published in Cell Metabolism in July 2020, to give you a time frame, builds and validates a lot of the previous work that's been done, while adding some of its own interesting tidbits along the way. Are you excited? I am. I could sense it. So without further ado, let's explore. First, as always, let's review the goals of the study. So we have everything put in the proper perspective. This was the first randomized controlled trial that compared the weight loss efficacy of a four hour feeding window compared to a six hour feeding window. And all this was done in adults with obesity. For this study, researchers specifically looked into weight loss and metabolic disease risk parameters of the four hour group and six hour group compared to each other and compared to a control group with no intervention. Okay, you got it? So let's move to the methods. This was a 10 week randomized trial where participants were placed in one of the three groups. Participants were randomly separated based on age, sex, and BMI or body mass index. And this kind of talk as a fan of research and science makes me smile. Randomized control, intermittent fast, and time-restricted feeding. Let's go. Now that we understand how the participants were broken up and what protocols they had to follow, what were the diet rules? Well, there weren't any. Where can I sign up? Can I sign up for this? Wow. The only rules for this study was the timing. Now, although this was a 10 week study, the intervention actually lasted about eight weeks where the four hour time restricted feeding group was instructed to eat between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. 
and the six hour time restricted feeding group was instructed to eat between 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. And as you can imagine, the control group could do whatever they want. Now, the thing that drove the compliance rate rather high here was the ability for all groups to be able to participate in that very, very social meal of the day, and that is dinner. We've talked about this on a lot of other videos. You kind of know my stance on dinner. A lot of the research points to earlier eating is actually better, but who cares about research when we're talking about being social and hanging out, right? So it's a balance. Anyway, I digress. And like we talked about before, during these feeding windows, participants were instructed to eat at libidum. Whatever they wanted, how much they wanted, just as long as it was confined into that eating window. No counting calories, no diet restrictions. Do what you normally do inside a window. Makes it simple. And this right here makes it interesting for me because you take diet restrictions and way of eating out of it and it all of a sudden makes it a lot easier to comply. Now, the only thing that researchers relayed to participants in the interventions group in the four hour and six hour groups was stay hydrated, drink a lot of water, and they were allowed to consume energy free beverages such as black coffee, tea, and diet sodas. Now, before we get into the results, I will remind you one more time. The primary metric that was measured here by researchers was change in body weight. But it also had some very interesting secondary measures, such as insulin resistance, blood pressure, plasma lipids, inflammatory cytokines, oxidative stress, and overall diet adherence. Okay, so all that is cool. It's time. Let's talk results. Because that's all anyone cares about. Let's see how the two intervention groups and the control group fared on all these measurements. First, for weight loss. As you can imagine, the four-hour time-restricted feeding and six-hour time-restricted feeding groups fared much better than the control groups, losing significantly more weight throughout the study. Now, the interesting thing here was there wasn't a noticeable difference between the four-hour and six-hour group when we're talking weight loss. Essentially, they lost just about the same. That was cool. Now what about fat mass? By the end of the eight weeks, fat mass was significantly changed and differed across all three groups. With, again, as you can imagine, the four hour and six hour group losing a lot more fat than the control group. And yet, again here, there wasn't a significant difference on fat mass loss when comparing the four hour and six hour group. Hmm, it's almost like they had two hours in the bank here now. But let's continue. Now, when we talk lean mass, muscle mass, there was an interesting finding. The six hour time restricted feeding group actually lost the most when compared to the four hour group and the control group, which to be honest is a little confusing and I would wanna get some more data on the potential exercise routines in these groups that could explain it in this small sample size. So that would be something further to look into to see if there was any correlations there. I think there might be, but that's just me reading a paper. Anyway, moving on. What about the bad type of fat? Visceral fat. That fat that lines your organs, hardens, is associated with a higher risk of overarching metabolic disease. Yeah, that fat. So throughout the eight weeks of tracking visceral fat, unfortunately, there were no significant changes across any of the three groups which again, I would attribute to a small sample size, the limited duration of the actual study or intervention, and just not knowing some of the other factors. What you gonna do? Moving on, we will finish off with that thorn that nags so many people's side, and that is oxidative stress and inflammation. First, when we're talking oxidative stress, researchers took a look in one of the common markers of oxidative stress in lipids and found that there was a significant decrease over the course of the study for both the four hour and six hour intervention group, which is good. But when we turn to markers of inflammation, and here specifically they looked at IL-6 or interleukin-6 or TNF-alpha, there were no significant changes in inflammation over the eight week study, which is pretty consistent with all the other time restricted feeding, intermittent fasting, human trials and data out there. Oxidative stress markers, it makes a difference. Inflammation, not so much. 
from the limited data we have thus far. So, all in, this study displayed that time-restricted feeding, whether six hours or four hour feeding windows, has a pretty substantial effect in improving several health markers for midlife obese adults. Which, when you put into terms how prevalent that demographic is across the globe, in my eyes, these results are pretty powerful. It's research like these that continue to reiterate and revalidate that fasting, in this case, time-restricted feeding, is one of the best health-promoting interventions on the market. The simple fact that all you need to do is potentially adjust the feeding window with no diet rules or restrictions just puts it in a class of its own. Now, you know my philosophy. If you're gonna go this far in trying to do something healthy, like implementing a intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding protocol, you might as well add the health multiplier and eat some healthy, nourishing foods while you're at it. I mean, right? Who knows? You might even start, dare I say it, craving health. Nah, I'm just kidding. That's, that's crazy. Or is it?